Let's pray as we go to the Word of God for guidance this morning. Father, we come now before you and we ask you to speak to us. We pray that we will hear a rhema word that means a now in season thought or concept that makes sense to us. We pray for a light bulb moment in our hearts where we read the scriptures and it makes sense. It becomes applicable and it becomes healing and it becomes guidance. It becomes comfort. I pray that we will hear your voice speak to us in a unique way. Speak clearly, Lord. Help us to focus on you. Help us to pay attention to what you are saying. Help us to get quiet in our minds. Help our thoughts to be focused on you, not on the busyness of our lives, but on you. And speak to us a word that will sustain us for this day, this coming week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning I'm going to conclude the series on He Heals the Brokenhearted. And I'm very, exciting. I'm very excited about what I'm about to share with you. Because it's good. And I say that humbly because it's not my concept of thought. What I'm about to share with you this morning, I read in a book a few months ago, really a few weeks ago, and the name of the book is It's Not Supposed to Be This Way. It's by Lisa Turkhurst. I keep struggling with her name. But I, I read this and I kind of saw this picture of what she was trying to explain. And it just... It just made so much sense to me. It was so beautiful. So my prayer is that God will help me to convey that thought with you this morning. And I'm entitling this, Three Prayers for the Brokenhearted. Now we have been studying Psalm 147 verse 3, where David says that God is the one who heals the brokenhearted. He's the one that bandages our wounds. And that verse in itself has sustained me over the last few weeks, has carried me. God heals. He knows that my heart is broken, and He's the one that can bandage my wounds. So three prayers for the brokenhearted, and you can be brokenhearted because of a variety of things. I think it's a very accurate word, because you can sometimes go through something that it literally feels like your heart is aching. So if you find yourself in a low place, I believe these three prayers can apply to all of us in some way in our lives. So the first prayer is, help, my heart is crushed. The second prayer, you make beautiful things out of dust. And the third prayer, let your living waters flow over my soul. Help, my heart is crushed. You make beautiful things out of dust and let your living water flow over my soul. So now I'm going to touch on a few verses that talks about being crushed, that talks about dust, and talks about water, the living water. It's going to be from all the New Testament, but again, my prayer is that in the next few minutes, this would just make sense to you and you'll see a beautiful picture of some central themes that run throughout the Bible. I believe you'll hear this and you'll say, wow, this makes sense. So we'll start in Psalm 147, just a few verses. Verse 1, the psalmist writes, Praise the Lord, how good to sing praises to our God, how delightful and how fitting. Now remember, this is his intro to a psalm that talks about being brokenhearted. So a reminder for us, it's always delightful and it's always fitting to praise God regardless of what we go through because even praising Him is healing in itself. 
Then he says in verse 3, He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. Verse 5, How great is our Lord! His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. Verse 7, Sing out your thanks to the Lord. Sing praises to our God with a heart. So keep that in mind. God heals the brokenhearted. Now two passages that deals with this concept of being crushed. First of all, Jeremiah 8, 18. You are my comforter in sorrow. My heart is faint within me. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? These are rhetorical questions. Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? This was written by Jeremiah when the state of the nation touched his heart. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? And then he says, I'm crushed. I see my people are crushed. I am crushed. Isaiah 53, 5 talks about Jesus on the cross. He was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed. Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are Healed. Is there no physician? By his wounds we are healed. Jeremiah says, I'm crushed. Jesus was crushed. Now a few verses that deal with the concept of dust. Very first mention of dust, Genesis 2, 7. Then the Lord God formed mankind from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. That word means the dust became animated. Animated means movement. What's an animation? A cartoon means it's just figures, but they come alive. So the dust became animated. The dust had life. Isaiah 64, 8 says, Yet you, Lord, are our Father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the works, the work of your hand. Now, Isaiah just referenced Jeremiah, who in detail talks about the potter, the potter's table and the potter's touch. The reason I bring up clay there, dust can become clay. Dust is the basic element of clay. And then lastly, the water, the living water, John 9, verse 6. After saying this, he, that's Jesus, spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Jesus healed the man by spitting into dust, making that dust mud, and then the man was healed. And then the last passage, John 7, 38. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. So again, three prayers for us to pray. Help, my heart is crushed. You make beautiful things out of dust. Let your living water flow over my soul. Now here's the rhema moment, and then I'll unpack it. If I took this hammer and I hit this glass, I'm not going to hit it any harder, this hammer could potentially crush this glass. But if I hit it first, it won't necessarily crush it, it will break it. It will scatter it. It will crack it. So crushing comes from being repeatedly hammered. So crushing means I was broken, 
And then I was broken more and broken more and I was crushed. I could, with this hammer, if I had the right workbench and had the right space, I can grind this glass <laughs> down to a very fine powder and it can become dust. So sometimes in life you get crushed to the point of dust. But the beautiful thing is God has always been able to do wonderful work with dust. So the crushing can lead to dust, but the dust can receive the living water and then the potter can start forming newness of life. Let's unpack those few thoughts. First prayer, help, my heart is crushed. There's a book in the Bible called Lamentations. I'll be honest with you, I don't read it much. I don't think I can quote one verse from Lamentations. But I have read it because I've read the whole Bible front to back several times, so I know I've read it. I know there are probably some familiar passages in there. But I, I find it interesting, especially in this season of my life, that there is a whole book of the Bible that is about lamentation. Let me give you a definition of lamentation. Lamentation is a passionate expression of grief and sorrow. Two-thirds of, of the Psalms are called Lamentations, where David passionately expresses his grief and his sorrow. For example, in Psalm 56, verse 8, David says, Lord, you know my sorrow. And then he writes, he says, in the New Living, it says, you collect my tears in your bottle. Some translations say, you record my tears on your scroll. So, there's room in our faith for lamentation, and I'm so glad that there is room in our faith for that. Because there are times in your life where you become brokenhearted, and you have deep wounds, and you're hurting bad. And I'm glad that it is okay for us to passionately express our grief and sorrow. And then even that in itself is healing. Now I'm going to be honest with you. In my faith walk, there was a time, I would say 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago, where my approach was much more focus on what's right. Focus on the good. Focus on what you have instead of what you don't have. And I believe there's a place for that. But I realize now that, thankfully, I never gave somebody advice on grieving because at that point in my understanding, my advice would have been something of, well, try to move on. Try to think about the people that you still have in your life. Try to remember the good memories. But in so many words, shift your focus. And really, that would have been an unhealthy way of grieving. So I'm so glad that we have permission to cry out to the Lord and be passionately honest in expressing, Lord, I am hurting. My heart is crushed. My heart is broken. I have wounds. You can say that to God and you can say that and express that and he knows and he cares. In Jeremiah 8 verse 18, Jeremiah in the middle of his own crushing, in the middle of his sorrow and grief, he's, he identifies that God is the one who comforts in sorrow. He, and then he says, my heart is faint within me. I am crushed. Is there no bomb? Is there no physician? I am struggling and I need help. 
My heart is faint within me. I am crushed. And this is what I've seen in life. There are times where you go through something bad and then it seems like bad gets worse and worse and worse. And I'm sure if you think about your life, you've experienced that. And it seems like this is so hurtful and then something else gets added. And to me, that's a very good visual where something can break this glass and then this glass is in trouble. But sometimes there's a breaking and a cracking and it continues till there's a complete crushing. And if, if you've ever been there, that's a low place and it is very hurtful. So I'm thankful that biblical characters led and inspired by God expressed my heart is faint within me. My heart is broken. I'm crushed. We have an example of David when they went to Ziglag. <coughs> Him and his men were fighting a war. They come back and the whole city was burned to the ground. The wives and the children were taken captive. <coughs> and it says that David and his men wept till they could weep no more. Have you ever been in such a low place? Have you ever been there? My heart is faint within me. And we go through these things in life. I've, I've shared with you part of my family's story. And it came to mind when we were in South Africa now, because we drove by the scenery and I explained to Becca this is what happened was where we went through something where we felt crushed. And it involved my parents on a Friday night went to a meeting at the school where my mother was teaching. Me and my brother Pierre were at home. I was probably about 14, 15. He's three years younger than me. We just hear sirens. The neighbor comes and calls us. We run out to the road in our pajamas, barefoot. And a, car, a truck had come down this hill hit my parents from behind, hit the, the, sorry, a car went down, hit them so hard, hit them three times, the car spun around, my dad got out, a truck came down the hill, it was about getting dark, and then the truck ran over the car with my mother still inside of it, somehow she got slung out of the car, me and my brother show up, all we see is our car like mangled up, and I just vividly remember a John was barefoot standing there. A stranger took us to the hospital. To this day, I don't know who that was. A couple, a uh, husband and wife, saw us, took us to the hospital, saw my mother all like cut up, bleeding. She had broken her leg, lots of injuries. The next day, when my dad and my brother Pierre went to go visit my mother in the hospital, our second vehicle got stolen outside the hospital. That's a good example of, I was broken and now I'm being crushed. We go through these things in life where it's one thing after the other and you literally get to your point where you cry out, my heart is faint. I cannot take this. Is there no balm? Is there no physician? <clears throat> well, that's an Old Testament question that got answered for us. Because the question, is there no balm, has been answered. There is a balm in Gilead. Is there no physician? Yes, there is a physician. This physician was crushed himself. And because of his crushing, by his wounds we are healed. So since Jeremiah used the term physician, think about this. This doctor, Dr. Jesus, is the doctor that you can go to with a certain diagnosis and with certain symptoms. And he's the doctor that didn't just study that and have the head knowledge. He's the doctor, for example, that had that same disease, that had that same diagnosis. And he felt the exact symptoms that you are feeling. Wouldn't you want to go to that doctor? Because not only did he feel it, live through it, 
he also then invented the cure, the medicine. That's the doctor I want to see. Now, we are very grateful for medical science and the head knowledge and the, the research. But I think there comes a point when you sit across the desk and somebody tells you, I walked through this myself, it brings an extra comfort. And that's who we have in Jesus. He was crushed. He felt the crushing that my mother felt in that car on the side of the road. He felt that. He felt the crushing that the two teenagers felt. <coughs> when you're a teenager, everything's amplified. So to see a car wreck and have no idea where your parents are. There was somebody there with us who felt that. He was crushed. He was crushed. Every crushing you might ever go through in your life he felt it, and by his wounds we are healed. So it is very okay for us to say, Lord, help, my heart is crushed. That's the first prayer. Thankfully, we don't have to stop there. Then there's the next prayer we can pray. Lord, you make beautiful things out of dust. In Psalm 147 that talks about our broken hearts, we are reminded that God's power is absolute. He is a creative God. He has creative ability. God can make something out of nothing. God looked at chaos, Genesis 1 and 2, and brought order, brought life, brought all of creation that we see today. And then he took dust in Genesis 2 verse 7 and he started forming that dust and then he breathed life into the nostrils of that shaped human and gave life from nothing, from dust. Now it makes sense that the Bible would say he can bring beauty from ashes because ashes is dust. When something had burned down, to the ground, all that's left is ashes, and it feels final, and it's over. And God says, I can still make beautiful things out of dust. Let's remember that God is absolute. And if you ever hit that rock bottom, and if you ever feel completely crushed, this is where hope comes in. You look around you, and all you see is dust. That means you look around you and there's nothing familiar left. But the same God that started human life from dust and started fellowship between God and humanity from dust is the same God who then later some of the prophets got this vision. Oh, he's like a potter and we are the clay. He can take this dust, he can put his water on it, he can make clay from it, and he can take what was a place of hopelessness, a place of defeat, a scene of destruction, and he can take that and he can make something new. And this is the beautiful thing as, as children of God. When you get to that low place, if you have a vibrant relationship with God and if you take time to get quiet and talk to Him and you share your heart, He gives you hope. Even in the middle of the worst times, that's the God of hope. 
He cannot help himself. You'll have hope again. And that's been so encouraging. Now I understand, because I've looked at people's lives and they tell me their story, and I say, how did you make it through that? How did you get up that Monday morning? How did you get up that next? How did you make it through the next week? Well, we are people of hope. God can start taking the dust and start forming. And as the potter, there's always hope. There's always hope. We are the clay. You are the potter. I love that Isaiah refers to the potter as a father. The same way that Jeremiah said he's a comforter in our sorrow. Well, it's the father that's creating. He can make new things out of my dust even out of my worst and lowest heart I complain, he can make something new. That's where hope comes in. There's hope, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope. He can make something new out of this. He can make something beautiful out of this. Well, how does that happen? The dust needs some water. So there's our third prayer. Lord, this is where I am. I've been crushed. But I have hope that you're the miracle dust creator. So let your living water flow over my soul. We reminded that his understanding is beyond our comprehension. It's two synonyms. God's ways are higher than our ways. So in the middle of this, we trust His nature and His character and His goodness. And we are okay with question marks. you got to learn to be okay with the question marks. Some things get answered. Some things don't. But overall, you see, He is faithful. His understanding is bigger than our comprehension. And I just love that Jesus used various methods of healing blind eyes, which there's a lesson for us. God is the healer and there is no one formula or fixed way. He's going to touch you. He's going to heal you. He's got so many ways. So he spits in the mud and that in itself might have been a little offensive if you were there and you desperately looking for help. But this is Jesus The God of life, the God of the living waters, adding some living water to something useless, dust. And he makes mud out of it, and mud is clay, and he puts it on the man's eyes, and there's healing that takes place through that. That's the healing balm. The healing balm can come in so many ways. So when you're in that low place and that low state, Just say, Lord, let your living waters flow over my soul. Because when Jeremiah said, my heart is faint within me, he talked about the inner heart. And then John 7, 38, Jesus says, well, guess what? Living waters is going to flow from within. I can start healing on the inside. So is there no balm in Gilead? Yes, there is. Healing balm. And the healing balm, the living waters, can look so many ways. To me, you know, the Bible is full of the picture of dry land and water, or desert and then water, or nourishment. So that in itself is encouraging, like, Lord, my heart is crushed down to dust, but you add water, just like, It's like when you're really thirsty and you have a sip of water. It's newness of life. When there's been a drought and all of a sudden it rains, it's like the earth is rejoicing, the plants are rejoicing. There's just newness of life. Let your living water flow from within. And this living water, this healing balm can happen in so many ways. I do believe that it happens on a personal level first. You and God. Stillness, getting quiet, reflecting. I'm so glad that as a church, we were busy with the 21 days of prayer at the beginning of January, and we were about done with that. And I'm so glad that I added that to my daily reading time 
And it was encouraging as we started a new year. So I already had that as my foundation. But during your time of being crushed, getting still with the Lord, and listen, stillness is hard. When last were you able to just sit down quietly for five minutes? Try it. It's tough. Because you're like, what? I need to do something. Where's my phone? What's happening? I'm missing out. You know, or phone calls or your to-do list or, you know, picking up the... Ch Life is busy. So we need to find that stillness. We need to get quiet. There are times to pray about external things and to pray for people and intercede. But I truly believe it starts with first just getting quiet before the Lord and say, Lord, right now, it's like the analogy in the airplane. I need to, when the oxygen mass drops, I need to breathe myself and then I can assist others. Stillness, quietness, reading the Bible. Let the Bible speak to you. Let one verse speak to you. Like I said, to me last week, it was Psalm 56 verse 8. God knows my sorrows and He collects my tears in His bottle. Wow, what an awesome visual. Let me think on that thing. God has a big bottle filled with my tears. It starts on a personal note. And then God uses external things. People around you. Maybe a message that really speaks to you. A worship song. A deep conversation you can have with a close friend. Somebody who can pray for you. A car. And I was able to get quiet this past week and read some of the cards that was written by you from the church. Because we got back and we were just overwhelmed by cards. And I read it the first time and I scanned it, to be honest with you, and now I'm rereading it. I got it and I'm just reading a few at a time. Same with cards that I received from school. And there's a whole stack, and I basically made it through about 20, and I said, I'm just going to stop here, and I'm not going to just try and read through all of this, because this is a healing bomb. This is living waters. Somebody wrote, somebody from school, I don't know what age, what grade, but it's lower school, said, Mr. LaRue, my grandma passed last Wednesday, and I understand how it feels. And then just a little cross and a heart. Somebody said... I'm so sorry for your brother, but he is loving heaven right now. And I know he is missing you right now. A nice little rainbow and a smiley face. Here's a good one. This student said, Dear Mr. LaRue, I've been thinking about you. So first, I want to start off by saying sorry for your loss. And also, I'm here for you. And I know how it feels. Trust me, he won't be forgotten. He'll be up in heaven watching the successful things you do for our school. And God will surely be by your side. And then Philippians 4, I can do anything through Christ Jesus. One writes simply, I hope that you will have hope. And that's the message. Well, that's encouraging. I hope that you will have hope. And then my favorite one so far, somebody write, wrote, Dear Mr. LaRue, I'm so sorry for your loss. I have been through losses myself. So I hope this picture helps. And they drew a picture. It's got a little man on a skateboard with a ramp, and it says Super Ramp. And there's a cloud with the sun coming. Now that has been healing balm. I'm this picture has helped. I use that as an example of the living water, the healing balm can come in so many ways. And sometimes it starts by simply getting quiet and just pray these three prayers. Lord help, my heart is crushed. 
but even when it's crushed so badly that it's ground to dust, I know that you make beautiful things out of dust. So Lord, take this dust and let your living water flow over my soul. We are going to practice that here for a few minutes. I'm going to ask you to get quiet and you talk to the Lord. And I believe that this time is dedicated for healing to take place. You have an appointment with the great physician. In his hand, he has some healing balm. You're here. God's here. Let him go to work in your heart. Let him apply his healing balm. The altar will be open. If you want to come up and make this a sacred place between you and God, or right where you are, just allow the next few minutes, just allow the great physician, the Lord our healer, to apply some of his healing balm to your heart.